All right, so in this video, we're going to be looking at rotational kinetic energy, as well as moment of inertia and force and torque that affect those two quantities. So we'll start off by looking at this rotating disc over here. Now, let's say this disc is moving counterclockwise. It can be moving clockwise, but it doesn't really matter. Now, if we wanted to find the kinetic energy of the disc, we already know an equation for kinetic energy. It's mv squared over 2. But we cannot use this equation to measure the kinetic energy of this object because each individual particle of mass has a different velocity associated with it. So we have to change our reference frame to one of rotational kinematics, which is what we learned to do in the last video. So we'll start off with our known equation for kinetic energy and we'll treat it as though we're summing all of these individual particles. Individual tiny little masses were summing all their different velocities. So we'll say there's an infinite number of those little particles just to get as precise as possible and we're going to sum each and every one of them their mass times their velocity squared over 2. But we know that this limit right here is just the definition of an integral. So we know that the kinetic energy then is the integral of v squared over 2 times the individual little particles of mass. Now we know uh, from our last video that v equals omega times r, which is just omega equals v over r rearranged. So we can substitute this in and get that kinetic energy equals, we'll bring omega out because it's a constant in this case, we're not accelerating the system at all, equals omega squared times the integral of r squared, oh, we'll put that over too, r squared dm. Now, we're going to define this quantity, integral of r squared dm, as i, and i is what is known as the rotational inertia of an object, sometimes called its moment of inertia as well. And this quantity is going to become very important for when we look at uh, the analog for Newton's second law, as well as for our rotational kinetic energy right now. And so, by making that substitution for uh, this integral as a constant term i, because it will come out to be a constant, there's no variables left, because you're just going from, you know, the inner most mass to the outermost mass, you end up with the total kinetic energy equals this constant i times omega squared over 2. And you can see this quadratic over 2 fits very nicely with our current perception of kinetic energy. So because this omega is the rotational analog of velocity, we can conclude, therefore, that this I is the rotational equivalent of mass. It basically corresponds to how difficult it is to get something turning. Now that we've looked at kinetic energy, we're going to move on to the concept of torque. And torque is basically the equivalent of linear force in that torque is the ability of a force to make objects rotate. In other words, uh, instead of forces making something accelerate linearly, torques make them accelerate radially. So torque is uh, the rotational analog of force, as we've already discussed, and it's usually represented by the Greek letter tau. Now, my taus are poorly drawn, but that's what uh, I'm going to be using to represent torque this whole time. And it's mathematically defined. It's a vector, first of all just like force is, and it's mathematically defined as the cross product between the position vector, that is the position at which the force is applied, and the force vector. And for those of you who don't know the cross product, um, it's basically the norm of the two quantities times the sine of theta between them. So what this basically means is that it's the projection, let's say you have this position vector r, and this torque vector f. It's the projection because you have uh, this angle 
theta right here. It's the projection of the latter vector onto the first in the perpendicular direction. So in this case, the cross product uh, would yield this quantity here. But because the cross product uh, is a three-dimensional function, realistically, this torque would point either out of the paper, which will represent with an X, or into the screen, which will represent with an O. For all intents and purposes here, though, we're just going to be using it to think about how much the force points in the direction of whatever it's trying to rotate. And just to get an intuitive sort of feel for it, we'll look at the three parts that contribute to how big the actual torque is. So we'll look at three example forces pushing on this lever here, and we'll say it rotates about this axis. Uh, you have force one here, force two here, and force three right here. Now, you can probably tell just intuitively that it's going to be much easier for force three to push this lever around than it will be for force one, and that's because of the R component of the definition of torque. Basically, it has a larger position vector coming out from the axis to the point uh, where the force is applied. Now, two is going to have a hard time because it only has that much torque or that much force actually pointing in the direction of the torque. The horizontal component along the position vector does absolutely nothing to help rotate the body. All it does is push outwards and stress this axis in here. And one is going to have a difficult time because of that tiny uh, position vector, basically. If you had a large force and this tiny position vector, you would exert the same amount of torque as a small force out here at number three. So the force and the position at which you push are equally important in the torque. Now this rotation right here, determining the sign, whether it's positive or negative, follows the right hand rule. Basically, if you curl your fingers around the direction of rotation or the cross product between R and F, if your thumb, basically you curl your, fin your fingers around like this, like you're making a fist, and then if your thumb points to you, in other words, it points out of the screen, then the torque is positive, else the torque is negative. So if you have to curl your fingers that way and point your thumb into the screen, then the torque is negative. And it should be noted, again, that uh, torque, much like force, can be superpositioned. So in other words, the sum of the torques, or the net torque, rather, acting on an object is the sum of each individual torque. So if you have, you know, one force, a tiny force pushing here, and a large force pushing here, you could theoretically cancel those out such that the object wouldn't accelerate uh, rotationally. Our last lesson in this video is going to involve deriving a uh, rotational equivalent for Newton's second law, which if you recall is F equals MA. Now, in the rotational frame of reference, we're all, all we're considered with, all we're concerned with rather, is the angular acceleration of the object, so how fast it's increasing or decreasing its rate of rotation. So we want to get this equation in terms of that alpha. Now we know that alpha equals A over R, so bringing this R up, we can substitute R alpha in for A in this equation. So we get that F equals M R alpha. We also know from the definition of torque that torque is R times F, simplified for the, the sine of theta. We'll just say that it's a perpendicular force acting on it, so it's tangential at all points. So substituting, let's say uh, we have to multiply then by R to get something we can substitute in the torque for. So we multiply through by R, you get RF equals MR squared alpha or torque equals m r squared alpha. From here though, if you'll recall, uh, our definition of uh, 
rotational inertia or moment of inertia is essentially just r squared times the integral of dm. Well, r squared integral dm equals m r squared. Therefore, the torque equals i times alpha, just based on our previous observations and known equations. Now that uh, concludes our coverage of torque and moment of inertia, but we will be using these concepts uh, for the remainder of the next two chapters. Uh, in the next video, we'll look at the work done by an external force and torque, as well as the relationship between torque and potential energy.